It's all to him anyway, so.
strong. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour.
who are more gathered and you are here and I can feel you Lord the spirit is heavy <clears throat> We pray today that you help us to be more like you each and every day, to not give up the, the learning and the adventures with you, Lord, to save souls with you and to spread the good news everywhere we can. We know there are so many people out there lost and scared and lonely. And only you can fill that void in their life. So we pray for each and every one of them that you would send us to them, send them to us, send somebody to them to share you and your love that you once showed us that we can share with them. We love you so much, Lord. You are so good in every situation. We know that the battle is yours and we're going to give it to you each and every time because like I said before, you've never lost a battle. You will not start now. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you use pastor as a vessel today. Speak through him. Let the words sink into our hearts. And let us take it out and practice it out in the real world. Mm. We love you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love Trying to just even catch our breath, but people do, trying to do this 
for, for some odd reason, they, 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 they try to reach a summit. So even the mountain seems to usually describe a descriptive word for challenges, isn't it? You know, that we kind of go through, or trials, or tribulations, or whatever. We thought, sometimes we think our mountain is so, is so gigantic, a lot of times we just think that it would seem, can't, it can't get over it, you know, because it's so big, it's so huge, it's so tremendous, and, 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 they, and it looks so daunting. A lot of times, but today, see, I'm not, but I'm not talking about those type of mountains today. I'm going to talk, talk about the type of mountains that God actually wants us to climb. Because being each spiritual mountain is different, and each and everybody in here has a different mountain. Each and every one here has a different spiritual journey than somebody else do as well. And once you get on top of the mountain, man, the view is tremendous. It's beautiful. I mean, think about it. Think of Mount Everest for a second. I know everybody's seen pictures of, of people who climb it. And, they, and Mount Everest is the tallest mountain, I believe, in, in, in the world, right? I mean, you see everything. You see all the mountains below. You see the clouds over there. Even when we was Alaska, we was up there pretty high. And, and all you see the, the, I would call it fog, but a lot of times it's the clouds over there. I mean, it's so, it's so surreal. And a lot of times in our journey, it's exactly the same way our spiritual journey, our spiritual mountains that, that sometimes we climb, we, we see over everything, and it's so surreal. And each one of us has different views. So I'm going to talk about, and about five times in, in God's Word that He has called each and every one of His servants to climb mountains. So I'm going to look about five mountains today that God has, hopefully, has called us to climb. And the first mountain I want to look at is called Mount Arat. Okay? Mount Arat is, that, is actually located in Genesis. Mount Arat is actually based on where Noah kind of named it. And on here, if you read about this in Genesis 2 and verse 8, and he said, because he, he had his journey, his, his journey was actually different than anybody else's journey. He kind of landed on top of the mountain. But Genesis 8, it said, God remembered him. It said, on the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountain of Harat. Now, Harat is about 16,854 feet. That's pretty high. Now, Noah here, Noah's floating around in this ark for over almost six months. And here, and, and you kind of put yourself in Noah's situation here a little bit. It rained for 40 days, 40 nights, so you know that's at least about a month's time. So about 110 days, a little bit later on, you know, that he was floating around, nothing inside. He felt very isolated. He felt very alone. And a lot of times we do the exact same thing. We, we feel isolated. We feel alone. And a lot of times we feel like God has actually kind of forgotten us sometimes. So, so there's no doubt about it that Noah probably felt the exact same way. God, I haven't heard from you in about, you know, so several months here. I'm floating around in this ark you told me to build. Where are you? So Noah felt like he'd forgotten. Even Christians, even good Christians felt that throughout our time in our lives and we forget about God. So because of the great flood, it, it it lasted a lot longer than what he actually thought about. Because God didn't tell him how long it was going to last, did he? He said, I'm going to flood the earth. I'm going to build you this ark. you got to be inside of it. And it could be, he didn't say it could be five years, six years, or whatever. He says, you just go in. But see, if we do that, if we do, you know, hey, Ben, I'm going to build your ark. I'm going to put you in here. And you're going to be in there for six months. You're looking for that six-month date, right? Mm -hmm. You know there's going to be an end date. But God didn't tell him that. So he felt like he has forgotten. I am forgotten about God. And a lot of times in our lives, we do the exact same thing. The only thing he had to hold on to was the promise that God had actually gave him. Scripture tells us that God remembered Noah. And a lot of times, and even in my life, I, I, I feel like that. I feel like God sometimes has forgotten about me. But then, then I remember what his word says. Even my here, God remembered Noah. Now I remember that. God remembers me. Richard, a person, me, all the people in the world, you know, billions of people that are here, God remembers one, myself. So I thought that's kind of pretty cool that I know that God remembers me. <laughs> so if God, because Noah at the ark and shut him in, then it had to be God who actually opened the door to let him out. 
in the same way in our lives too as well. See, we, we can't help our trials and our tribulations and stuff that we go through, but the thing is, we can't even get out of them, but we know who can, but in due time, God will bring us out through everything that we go through, amen? Yeah. But we have to rely on Him. We have to trust Him. We have to remember that He promises all things are good for those who love Him. We need to remember that. So a rock here was God's safe place. A rock was actually a, a God's preservation, I guess you say. And thank God that he, he leads it beside the still waters. He restores my soul. I love about what God does for us. We need to remember all the stuff that he does for us. Even Mount Haran, even when we feel like we are forgotten, God remembers. Now, another mountain I want to kind of talk about, this mountain here is called Mount Moriah. We, we watched that a little bit the other night in the movie. Now, Mount Moriah is basically where our hearts are actually tested at. See, Genesis 22 talks about this in, in verse 2. It says, it says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the mountains of Moriah. See, around the mountain of Moriah is where we as disciples, where in a sense we have to take all that we love so much and we hold so dear in our lives and we have to sacrifice it. We have to give to God through the demonstration and obedience of our love. A lot of times we really don't want to do that too much. Because Moriah, Moriah, see, it's a personal place. It's a personal place of sacrifice. And the thing about the Moriah is this. It's not, a, it's not a debate room. It's actually a place of surrender. Because the Bible tells us that you are not of your own. You have been bought with a price. See, we need to remember that. Somebody sacrificed his own life for each and every one of us. Your life has been bought with a price. It wasn't bought with five cents or ten cents or even five bucks. It was bought with a human price. Blood price. Would you give your life for somebody you don't know? A lot of people wouldn't do that. But Jesus did. You talk about sacrifice. He sacrificed. He gave his all. He gave his all for each and every one of us. So Mount Moriah is, is, in a sense, it is a place of surrender. It is a place of sacrifice. But we need to understand that it's not of what we know. We may bother a price. See, God's purpose for Abraham was to be blindly obedient, and he did that. You talk about trust. God, don't want you to take your son unto Mount Moriah, and don't you sacrifice him, your only son. And when you get there, Take nobody else. I'm going to take wood and your son, and that is it. And I want you to slay him. I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to give him up because I told you so. Can we do that? See, and, and here he did exactly just that. Abraham did that. He did it obediently. You talk about blind trust. You talk about obedience. And when he raised up that dagger to sacrifice his only son, God stepped in at that point in time. He gave him a sacrificial lamb out there in the bush. Because he wanted each and every one of us. He wants us to be obedient exactly like Abraham is. Blind trust. No matter what. He said, Abraham, go to the land that I have promised you. And I will take care of you. Go to the land that you have never seen in your life. Give up everything. Okay, God. No problem. And in the movie, man, you know, which, you know, I like movies, but in the movie, Sarah, they didn't really depict Sarah very well in this movie. But she kind of, in a sense, opposite of everything he, he, he said about her. You brought me out here for nothing. But she was obedient to him because she was submissive to him because of the wife. And a lot of times, you know, Jane asked me, would you do the exact same thing? If God told you to sell the house and, and go somewhere else, would you do that? I said, well, first off, I have to ask God, God, is that for you? If it's your will, then yes, I will do what you ask me to do. But, just that, but if I hear myself where Richard, I think you need to sell and, and go over here, I don't, I don't know about it. But it has to be for God. God has to give me that affirmation. But would we do the exact same thing? Would we give up, sacrifice, everything that you have built for in your life, 
if God told you to do this or God had told you to do that. So Mount Moriah was exactly that. The sacrifice means that it costs us. Even when Jesus saw the widow, he saw exactly how much she gave. She gave everything that she had. She gave her, her, her two coins. Everything. You're talking about a widow person who don't have any family or anything else like that to have support her. But she gave everything she had to the offering. And Jesus said, look, she gave all that she had. Now, there's three kinds of offering people that are out there. One is actually kind of like a, kind of like a flint. A flint is basically where you rub two rocks together and kind of create a spark. Another person, or another, another offering is like a sponge. See, a sponge, when it is squeezed, it then, then, then it's when it expels what it's actually been holding, right? Another, another type is a flower. A flower, see, it gives up its beautiful aroma perfume freely. So, or, so what kind of offering, what kind of person are you? Are you? What do you give? Are you like a flint, or are you like a sponge, or are you like a flower? You know, do you give just a little bit? Or do you give, you know, when it's squeezed, when it's pressed? Or do you give like we're supposed to give, freely, without, without any kind of hesitation? Because a lot, a lot of people say, I, I really can't give today because I want to go on vacation. It's going to cost me a little bit of money. See, we need to be obedient to his word, whether or not that vacation be a big vacation or a small vacation. But I still need to give my tithe. I still need to give my offering to God. Also, we need to be where even our job and so forth, we need to kind of do that. Because even Mother Teresa said, all that is not given is lost. See, Mount Moriah is where God wants us to, where we already have the 95%. He still wants us to even give the 5%. He still wants to give everything that we have. So that, is that you? Is that your mountain that, that God is telling you to climb today? So Mount Moriah is basically it's where the heart is actually being tested. Another mountain we'll talk about is called Mount, is Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai in, in, in Exodus 19, 17 said, Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. See, Sinai is where God and man, in a sense, they, they came face to face right here. It is a place of revelation. It is a place of revelation where, where God and you, of all times, we need to meet. So here, you know, all, the, all the Israelites, they, they came to this mountain. And when the people saw the mountain full of fire, man, you kind of got to picture this. Okay? Mount Sinai, a big old mountain where God is supposed to be. And they came to this mountain, and they saw the mountain of fire. And they, then they felt the, the earthquake that was happening. And then you hear God. Okay? That kind of part would freak a lot of people out. But the scripture says they trembled in fear. Here they came to meet God face to face, and they trembled in fear. Because, see, up to this time, all they had was signs and wonders. They didn't see anything about God. They, they saw the, you know, the ten plagues that God had, right? They brought them out of Egypt. And they saw right there in the Red Sea where God actually opened up the Red Sea. And they were, were, were able to walk upon the Red Sea on dry ground. But yet they never seen God at, at this point in time face to face. They have never met the living God until they came to Mount Sinai. See, it's a many place with God. See, in our place at Sinai is where we meet God. It's a treasured moment when we have a private audience with God. I'm talking about an intimacy. One-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, we have that nowadays. Scripture tells us in the Old Testament or in the New Testament that we should have a prayer closet. But here, they didn't have anything like that back then. Okay? But see, but, but see we see ourselves, we need to be bare to him, just like Moses did when he said, God, show me your glory. But oftentimes, guys, we, we don't see what's really right there in front of us. We talked about that this morning about, I think before we started the Sunday school lesson, about, about certain things we can't really see about houses and so forth. Okay, a lot of people can see a house, and they, all they see is a run-down place, but they can't see the potential that is actually really truly there. Me, I can look at things, I can, I can see that. I can picture that the way, the way it needs to be pictured, the way it needs to be renovated or whatever. Kind of like a story about, about a guy who moved from Colorado to Kansas. Cause, and when he, when he went to Kansas, he built him a house, had huge picture windows all across the house. 
So all he wanted to do was, was see the plains right there. But when he got there, again, do you know what he said? He said, I can't see anything. There's nothing there. Or let's take the contrast, a person moving from Kansas to Colorado because they want to see the beautiful scenery that is there. So they built a house with huge picture windows. And, and we looked at it, so I can't see anything because the mountains are blocking my view. It's all about a, a perspective, about how you see things. See, Mount Sinai, it's a place of revelation. See, God wants us to, to reveal himself to each and every one of us. So are we seeing him? Or are you just seeing what you want to see? Are you seeing right there is what is right here, right there in front of you? See, we must get to a place where, where, we, where we want to see him. Another mountain I'm going to talk about is called Mount Pisgah. Mount Pisgah is a, is a beautiful mountain. It's a mountain of dreams. Deuteronomy 3, 327 says, Go to the mount, go to the top of Pisgah, and look west and north and, and east and south. And it says, Look at the land with your own eyes. See, Mount Pisgah, like I said, it's, it's full of dreams. It's, full of, it's, it's a place of visions. It's where we can actually really go to in the mountaintop and where Moses actually looked at. He saw everything. He saw the land. He saw the land that was flowing milk and honey. And it was actually no longer a dream at this point in time. See, at this point, God said, go to this land that I've given you. Go and flow with milk and honey. And you'll be able to see it. All he can do is imagine or dream about it in his mind. But now it's right there in front of him. All he had to do was he, he was seeing what was actually right there. So the dream is now a reality. He can see the vision now that's coming to them. And he wants that for us too as well. He wants to see our visions come into reality because a lot of things we do in our life. Mitzvah is where we, we see that all of us are is that it's Christ. Because vision is actually a place of, of attainment. I was going to do this and I forgot to do this but I got kind of busy. It's kind of like this. If I laid a hundred dollar bill on this, on, this, on this place right here and you saw it, and it's yours. How would you go? How would you do it? Oh, I can see my hundred dollar bill, or I can see my thousand, or I can see my house, or I can see my job, or I can see my car. But I can see it right there. But the thing about it is, we have to go from here to there to get it. We have to go obtain it. So we can see it, but we have to go grab it. Lot, that's exactly what a lot of people do. They, they see their vision. They see their dreams. They can see right there in front of them, but yet we want to stay right here because we think everything should come to us. <clears throat> now, you know, there, there's no doubt about their Victories are won when people go forth to fight. Victories are not won if we're sitting here on the world. God, he, he can fight our battles, no, no, no doubt about that, because the battle belongs to him. But don't you think we have to do our part as well? Yeah. Ain't that what faith, what you say, Ben, about faith? Faith is a faith until it what? Until it's tested. Faith is a faith until you kind of get up and do something. Faith is a faith until you actually turn on that light switch. Faith is not faith until you actually do something about it. See, Mount Sinai is a place of vision. And it prays upon for a promise God he gives us to us. See, God's grace, his power, his wisdom, his love, his, his forgiveness, his everything is right there. And all we got to do is see ourselves at it. We have to see ourselves sitting at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Can you see that? Can you see that for yourself? See, if you can, see, then you have to attain it. You have to go for it. You have to keep pressing forward. You have to keep going on. You have to keep racing. A lot of people don't love to race. A lot of people even don't like to run, let alone walk. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but we still have to do it, though, don't we? Yep. We still have to go out there for it. Even Hebrews 11 talks about all the kings and judges. They, and if y'all have this, turn over there. We don't turn on line this when you read it. Hebrews 11, 32 is talking about through faith, okay, we're talking about the people, through faith they conquer kingdoms, they administer justice, and key word here, gained what was promised. See, that's the key word, gained. 
Because they went for it. They did it. They worked through their faith to do that. And all this promises that he gave them for, they went forth to possess it. See, visions don't just fall into our laps. We have to actually fight for them. There's a song out there that's talking about that. Uh, I forgot to write it down. It's talking about the, uh, uh, oh, should have wrote it down. But I know the song, is, uh, open the eyes of, uh, open the eyes, okay? It's not open the eyes of the heart, it's different. Because the guy said, you know, he's shaking his hand at God. said, God, why don't you do something? He said, I did, I created you. See, that's all the times we do the exact same thing. God, why don't you do something? <clears throat> but yeah, he did. He created each and every one of us. To have victory, we need to do something about it. To have victory, we need to go out to possess it. To have victory, we have to get up and do it through faith. We can't, in a sense, wait on somebody else, in a sense, to do that for us either. We have to do it ourselves. <coughs> And if we take the time to climb the Mount Pisgah, he will reveal all the hidden things of Christ, which can be ours if we just see that. See, Moses, all he could see was actually just one small part of, of, of the land of Canaan. But for a lot of us, see, it takes a lifetime of exploring and possessing what is actually ours through Christ. And sometimes just that journey, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. But we have to go do it. So Mount Pensacola is actually that. It's a mountain of uh, dreams, a mountain of visions, but we, it's not attainable unless we really do it. And the last mountain I'm going to talk about today, this one was Mount Calvary. So just like Mount Moriah was a, was a, was a place of surrender, Mount Calvary is actually a place of self-denial. Luke 23 talks about so when they came to a, a place called Mount Calvary, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on one side and one on the left. So Mount Calvary is a mountain where we, each and every one of us, we climb each and every day. Scripture tells us, also tells us in Luke 9 that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So this mountain is where we must die to ourselves. It's a place that we, that we suffer with the justice of this life that we have. It's a place or a mountain where we always see materialism in this world, but it's a place where God's laid it all out there, and you need to be humble and give me what's what's what is that you. In this place of self-denial, get myself out of the way. But see, it's 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 a choice to pay our even a choice to pay our tithe and our offering, knowing that it will cut into our vacations. Even a job that we sometimes we really want. It's taking the mainstream, I guess you say, without complaining, being an example as all that is it doing good to those who are unkind, especially you know the you know Lord, please forgive me my trespasses and those who trespass against me. And think about the this: the best joy about climbing this type of mountain is that we're climbing with Christ. Paul said in Philippians 3 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sharing and suffering, becoming like him even in death. So I hope y'all want to climb you know, this sacred mountain with Jesus today. And the last thing we're going to talk about here is, is about a grandfather and a grandson. They were walking, you know, doing nature eye, nature trail, and the grandson ran ahead of the grandfather, and, and the grandson, you know, saw this saw this stream is actually flowing pretty pretty heartily. I mean, it's pretty pretty heavy, pretty pretty swift. And, and the grandfather saw it too, and he yelled after the grandson, "Don't don't don't go across it. Stay there. Wait for me." And and then only the, the grandson kind of kind of listened to the granddad. He, he, and I kind of read this. Well, that ain't like my grandkids. They would went into the water. <laughs> But here the grandson listened to him, so when the grandfather got there, he lifted up his grandson and put him on the shoulders, and, and so they waded into the water, and the water kind of got waist deep on his chest high, but yet the water was still flowing pretty hard, but yet they, they together, going together, they were able to go across, all because of the weight that is combined. And once they got over the grandson, man, granddad, I, I'm, I'm thankful that you, you said this. I would not make it on my own. I could have done this by myself. And the thing with it is, it's the same way with Christ. 
We seem like we can go through a lot of things on our own. But see, Jesus is there, so let me help carry you. Let me help you get across this, this issue, this flowing river, or whatever it may be. Because those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall not faint. They shall not grow weary. Is that what Scripture says? So we need to do that. We see, whenever we feel faint, whenever we feel weary, we need to under, understand that, that Jesus said, take upon my yoke. My yoke is, is, is light, but you know, your burden is heavy. She said, let me trade your burden for my burden. But we need to be with him. So all these five mountains, as you called you, you know, are Mount Harad, are you, are you relying on God in your trials? Mount Moriah, have you surrendered what you love the most? Even at Mount Sinai, are you seeking a new revelation of God? When you're climbing or you're climbing Mount Pisgah, are you seeing visions that you can actually possess? Or even Calvary. Or you fellowshipping him with Christ and self denying. See, God is calling us to climb these mountains. I am not using these mountains as, you know, help me get through it. I'm, I'm, I'm using these as spiritual attributes to help you grow through Christ. Each and every one of these mountains should be something that you need to obtain. You need to grow with. We need to have that revelation. We need to do that self-denial. We need to, to surrender. We need to, you know, the, uh, uh, possess the things that God has actually really given us. We need to have all of these. Are you, want, are you willing? So this way, are you willing to climb? A lot of people say, I don't want to climb. Me, I want to climb. I don't care how thin the air is. I'll take my time. If it's cold, I'll put on a parker. But the thing about that is, when we climb, when we climb together, Eunice can help me, and I can help her in the same way with each and everybody in here. Do not forsake the assembly. Do not forsake your brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're going through something, guess what? They can help you out. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand this morning.